Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Dynamo's Dozen, the podcast that I bring you each and every single week where I talk about whatever may be on my mind from pro wrestling, sports, entertainment, music, movies, muesli, fresh socks and jocks, and everything in between, never forgetting the talc. I am your host in the Dynamo Kelly, and today I have a very, very special guest. Um, a lot of you may know him for many, many reasons. Um, he has uh, very kindly agreed to give me some of his time today. Um, and we're going to speak about, you know, everything that people want us to speak about and more. So without further ado, I would like to welcome my guest today, Mr. Ian Bailey. Ian, welcome to Dynamo's Dozen and thanks once again for taking the time. Absolutely, absolutely. So obviously, uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of a uh, lot of stuff to get into, but I always like to start off by putting um, some kind of a context to to my guests. And the best way to start, I suppose, is to tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of, you know, everybody knows that you've got a uh, a background in journalism and you're an author and so and so so on and so forth um but give us a little and, bit of background. three degrees and three degrees of law don't forget three degrees, three degrees of, of law. law well yeah well but that that came also that came yeah you added you added you upskilled um so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to um the lovely uh Re rebel county well, the Rebel County and the Independent uh, Free State or, of, you know, Ireland. Well, so my background is this. Um, my name is Ian Kenneth Bailey. I am obviously clearly male. Um, I was born in Manchester, uh, England, on a very cold January night in 1957, which makes me almost exactly, as we speak, 65 and a half years old. Uh, or young, 65 and a half years young. Yeah. And so what happened then? So my father was a butcher, a master butcher in Stockport, uh, Cheshire, which is now part of Greater Manchester. And so I grew up, that's where I was. I was born in Manchester Hospital, St. Mary's, and then grew up in Stockport. Um, and I was loved. I was, um, my father was a butcher, so food was never a pro problem at all. My father was relatively tall. My mother was fairly short. She was from the Welsh, short, stocky Welsh stock. Celt. Um, the Celt, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm part Welsh. I tell people I'm half Welsh. And the best part of me is the Welsh bit. You see. <laughs> the, the, the Welsh say, you see. Not like the Irish. Like, you know. Anyway, sorry, I'm digressing. So I grew up in sort of love, Manchester, and I was we went on holidays. And then when I think I was about five or six, my mother produced and um, my a baby sister, and it all started to go downhill from there. Because as soon as my baby sister could speak, uh, she was getting me into trouble and making false allegations against me. And the thing about false allegations is quite ironic, really, because that sort of followed me through my life. Anyway, so I grew up there. And then when I was about six or seven, my, my dad, uh, mother and father, Ken and Brenda Blesson, they're both up, you know, up there, I yeah. guess, uh, if there isn't up there, <laughs> yeah. um, moved to a place called Gloucestershire in yeah. the West Country of England. Yeah. And so from about the age of, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And I went to a grammar school. Oh, so you, you're educated there. Uh, they had a thing called the 11 plus. I don't know if they still have it. And the so I finished up going to a school called the Crypt School, a very ancient school um, in Gloucester that was founded by monks back in the 16th century, I think. It had a Latin song. I can even remember the Latin song. I could sing it for you if you wanted, but I'm not going to. Um, and I loved English. I loved, oh, I got taught Latin. Yeah, that was actually quite key when I look back because that, I love words and I've always liked writing in words and I've always, when I was younger, my father taught me how to write. My mother taught me how to, uh, my father taught me how to read by reading me things at night. Mm -hmm. Poet, uh, actually they were, fair, um, they were nursery rhymes, mm -hmm. poems for young children. And when I analyzed it, that's where the poetry first started to get in. You know, like Mary had a little lamb. She sure. also had a bear. I, 
I often saw her little lamb, but I never saw her bear. Actually, that's Spike Milligan. But um, <laughs> I love Spike Milligan, by the way. Any, any Spike I, Milligan? I know. I, 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 I met him once, actually, in the company of Prince Charles, and on in, in another life, in, in back in the Cotswolds in Gloucestershire. But that's another story. Yes. So yeah, so I grew up, and then I, um, I was very sporty. I played rugby. I played football. I played tennis. I played cricket, uh, basketball, badminton. Yeah, because you're what six um, three, were you? Six three in your. Mm-hmm. Six six three. I was always the tallest. I was always the tallest boy in my class. I was a head above all of the other 11, 12, 13 year olds, 14 mm. year olds. And every time there was a fight in the playground, which there often was, all the boys would gather around in a big circle and go, Go on, give them one, Mike. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I'd be yeah. the one, I'd be the one person when the te- the headmaster or something looked out into the school playground that they could see because I was the head and shoulders. And I was always the one called in to explain. Um, what you know, happened? <laughs> and sort of not blamed, but uh, yeah. Anyway, awesome. Oh um, yeah. So then I started writing at school. I, yeah. I actually started. I began writing. Um, I was about fourteen, fifteen, and I went to the local newspaper office in Gloucester, the Gloucester Citizen, still going, part of the Associated Newspapers Daily Mail group. And I said I was interested in becoming a journalist. And the guy took me round and he showed me the print room. He showed me the the sub editors and the reporters and he, he uh, and, and then he gave me the sort of idea of what made a story mm-hmm. and um i remember i got a, my first story that i got into print was at about 15 and it was something to do which happened at the schoolyard the, the bees came in a swarm of bees and the, the fire engines came and i rang up the newspaper and there it was on the front page that evening so um yeah and that brought you, obviously, you, you had a successful, obviously, career over in the UK and you were... Well, you know, what, 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 what happened then was, so, you know, you go, you, you do your exams, we did mm. things called O-levels then and A-levels. And I, I was very good at English, uh, biology, history, um, not very good at maths. Mm-hmm. And I became indentured. Then I applied, I, you know, when you, you, so what are you going to do with your life? Well, journalism. Mm-hmm. And I joined a freelance news agency, excuse me, which is still going to this very day. It's called the Gloucester and County News Service, run by a very grand man called John Hawkins. And he took me on and he indentured me. I was actually one of the last people to be indentured, where the master agrees to train the, the pupil. I right? was mm-hmm. the pupil. Uh, and the, the thing was written and then it was sort of pulled down, you know, and you had one piece of the paper and I, and my, my job was to to be a general reporter and he understood to train me and send me to college which i went to in cardiff so that's that was you know and i loved it i loved it I, absolutely and i was very good at it well yes i was sorry i'm sorry i'm blowing my own trumpet but i was a naturally good uh journalist and my speciality was investigations and stories which people didn't want to be printed have printed Sure, that no, makes sense as well. And and it's funny that you mentioned obviously at the start that you uh, you followed your Welsh roots almost going up to going up to Cardiff to to do your to do your training. So that must have been nice. yeah, yeah, I did. And uh, actually, Wales is always very. I mean, come come what they call it over there. The interesting thing, I'm 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 learning Gaelic uh, bit by bit, incrementally. Stelga, uh, and I couple of Fokal and Biog. Um, but the interesting thing about the Welsh language is what did you just call me? <laughs> the well the interesting thing about the welsh language is it's so it's so fucking complex yeah, and yeah, weird yeah. some names actually a lot of a lot of the things are exactly the same in irish gaelic like sure cruet cruet is which is harp sure there's a welsh harp and an irish harp yeah but um no anyway so what happened then was i so at the age of about mm, after i finished my indentures my training i began my own freelance operation and I was a correspondent for all the Fleet Street papers from the Sunday Times and Observer right down to the, the Red Tops mm-hmm. and the BBC, independent television. And I was operating out of a town called Cheltenham, which I know a lot of Irish people know very well because Correct. of Presbury Park Correct. and the Cheltenham Race Week, where the, the Irish take over um, Cheltenham. I used to do very well that week. The great stories. I, I was a great one for breaking stories. I tell you, not to do with the horse racing, but to do with the 
Uh, shenanigans going on. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's an Irish thing. Tell, sh- it's an Irish thing. Shall I tell you a little story? There's a oh, hotel, right. I won't mention the name of the hotel because I think it's still going in Cheltenham. Year on year, certain people booked the rooms because they knew they were going to be at the races. And it was interesting because the top floor, which was full of fairly big suits, year on year was booked by um, professional ladies professional ladies ladies of the night shall we say <laughs> i think that's yeah 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 shady ladies of the night mm. uh, and they would come down because when Cheltenham race week goes off you'll get people like as famous as jim sheridan you'll get a lot of money you know very very rich people will descend on Cheltenham and win something on the races and maybe they're away from single or they're away from their wife and guess what they'll want a bit of knocky so anyway i'm digressing a bit but there we are but it's to it's to be expected. So what, tell me how, yeah. how tell me how your journey brought you to Ireland. Ah, right. So I was operating between Gloucestershire and London and Fleet sure. Street. Yeah. And I had a little Pierre de Terre up in 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 uh, London, um, in Stockwell actually. And but the the funny thing is that in London I found the people that I would be associating with and getting on very well with interested in and fell into two two different gen demographic groupings i got on very well with jamaican people um love their music love their food love their culture and also irish people okay and i even started taking irish lessons in in london um okay so my first introduction to to ireland or era or erin was in April of 1986. A friend of mine had his father had a cottage in a place called Crookhaven, Crookhaven, down in in on, right in the far corner. And he said, "Come on over, Ian. I want you to meet an old journalist. He lives over there. He's legendary. Pat Murphy was his name. Passed away now. Come over for Easter." So we came over, and I just fell in love with it. What? What? It was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. We were here for a long weekend. The people seemed great. The crack was mighty. I went back to London. And then over the years, I came back on other trips. And it's only Glastonbury's just happened, hasn't it? Nine, uh, first 50th year of Glastonbury. Um, I So that was 1990. So I uh, I think on New Year's Eve of 1990 into 91, I, I decided my rev revolution i'm going to start a revolution from my bed and uh, that's um anyway uh i decided i was i had contacts in ireland i had um a new people contacts on a farm in waterford and various contacts mm-hmm. and also a sort of connection with whisk or albeit loose so i decided that what i was going to do was to leave my little flat in the heart of decomposing nation take the tube train for the station and come to ireland and people very often say to me, they say, a Cork person might say to me, yeah, yeah. that's how they call, call me down in Cork. What brought you to Ireland? And I very often, I will say, the St. Brendan Ferry boy, yeah. because the St. Brendan Ferry was the ferry that used to run from Wales to Cork. Okay. So that's what, so the answer to what brought me to Ireland was the St. Brendan Ferry. And that's a fair answer. I like that answer. You see, you do have a way with words. Some might say a wordsmith, maybe. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think it goes with the trade, doesn't it? You know. You yeah. Know. Yeah. No. Yeah, I, I, I gather you you're a bit of a wordsmith too. I I heard on the grapevine. You, I try you know, to be. Have, yes, I, I do try to be. Have 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 the gift with the uh, the old pen. You know. Pen and the 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 tongue. Some say a wicked tongue at times, but uh, I digress. I, um, I digress. I, 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 I still have the ink, but I've ceased to write with quills. But it, it, what a fine art. Uh, what a fine art. Um, Ian, let's, uh, let's, let's chat. You, you obviously, um, you know, a lot of people want to know, okay, when's Ian going to ask Ian uh, the question? But uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in a little bit of a different way here because obviously, you know, 
multiple documentaries have come out, which we will get into. But obviously, what what, what 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 question? Will you marry me? Or what, what, what's the question? <laughs> You're just looking for my surname, Kelly. You see, you want you want you want to be you want to have the you want to have that good strong Celtic Gaelga name. <laughs> but um, obviously, um, the the unfortunate um, murder, I suppose, of Sophie, Sophie just gone the Plantier. Um, which was now 26 years ago. Which is well, what, what, should I fill in very quickly between when I arrived in 1991 to, should I, because... Well, yeah, 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 100%. Because right, I, okay. no, okay. I want you to okay, have the right. platform. Yeah, 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 100%. Um, so what happened was, so I had connections in West Cork, I had a base in West Cork, and then I had other plans and, and contacts to go and visit. So in on Midsummer's Day, um, 30 years ago, last midsummer i came over um i had all uh, what what material stuff i needed my clothes my books um and little artifacts boxed and they they subsequently came over delivered and i had put them in store uh, and then i had a month in crookhaven i started writing poetry well i was i don't was writing poetry but i started to write poetry seriously and um I then went on what you might call was a rather romantic, poetic, working poetic ramble around Ireland. I had contacts in the uh, Kilmontar, Garden County, Wicklow. Yep. Peter Power, grocer, unfortunately now passed away. Great musician, lovely man. And I had contacts in Waterford. So I went up to, I spent a month down in Crookhaven. That was great. Yeah, was sort of getting, you know, after after London and the rat race and the thing and the you know merry-go-round. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, it was wonderful. Um, started to get to know people, did a bit of writing, and then I went off on my romantic journey. So first of all, I went to see Peter Power. He'd invited me up and said I had a place where I could stay, so I went up there. This would be now. Oh, we're talking about. Mm, I came in June, July, then June, July, August. And I spent some time in County Wicklow and I, I wrote, I, I did jobs. So I was always looking for work and I, would, I was quite handy and fit then. Well, I, hopefully I still am. But I started to write poems and I wrote one in Evoca. Great spot, um, yeah. Lovely, beautiful. And I just sat down on a bench and I was just, shall I read you the poem? Please. It's not that long. Go for it. And it's called Many. Just many. And it, what it says is this. I'm sorry, I've got a slightly, I think it's the pollen. I'm slightly hay fevic, but only very slightly. You're getting emotional. So many, okay. other things which I, <laughs> many other things which I have had and many other things which I have lost. Many other things which I have wanted, many other things which I want not. Many other loves which I have had, and many other hearts are broken sad. Many other chances which have flown, and many the dreams like dandelions wind are blown. Many other tears that I have shed, and many other girls I would have wed. Many other roads which I have trod, and many other paths which lie ahead. Many other troubles I have borne, and many other trials as yet unborn. Many other times to make amends and many other chapters as yet untold before the story ends. Very chin good. Chin. Very good. And it's rather like it. prophetic, but it's rather prophetic when I read it now because you know, I know that, 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 you know, and then so I did that and then I, um, I worked on a farm in County Waterford. Uh, the, the Shanahan's, the lovely Shanahan's, William Shanahan, Bill, his father, now passed away sadly. And I was there and I was hired, would you believe it, as a human scarecrow. <laughs> human scarecrow. Seriously. And the scale behind that is this, that they, the, the Shanahan's then and still do have a, a maybe 150, maybe 200 acres of barley that have been growing for nine months, ten, nine months. And winter barley, it's called. And um, they, um, it was just coming up to ripening in the uh, September and October and November. Now, if anybody knows that part of Ireland, they'll know that the cr 
crows. You have flocks of crows, which are thousands in number, mm -hmm. thousands. I mean, maybe like a big, a big bunch could be like 15, 10, 15, 20,000 crows. And what they, the crow's really sharp. He's very clever, corvine. And he's got his eye. He's been watching the barley all year growing from little shoots. Mm -hmm. And now the, the, the barley's ripening and it's getting good. And the crow's desire is to eat the farmer's crop to husk. So my, my job was I was given a shotgun, I was given a flat cap, and I was sent away to the swords. And I had to get up with the dawn and stop the crows from landing on the barley because they, they, if, if one of these flocks lands, the whole crop is lost because it's flattened. And I became very adept at, uh, and I wrote, wrote a poem there. It came out as the, uh, I called it originally, I was calling it the Preachan Trilogy, but apparently I was pronouncing it incorrectly. It's the Prey Khan, the Prey Khan Trilogy, the Crow Trilogy. And then, so I did that for, uh, I think it was October, yeah, October, I came down to Skull. I had a chance of going out on a fishing boat from, um, oh, uh, Ring in, in County Waterford as the chef, because I like cooking. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't have been fishing, I'd have been cooking for the fishermen. And I thought, well, that's, you know, that, I, I, uh, that, that's, that's something that would be in a bit of an adventure. So I came back down to Scotland to get, ostensibly to get my winter coat and one particular winter item of clothing, my long black coat. Sure. Long black coat, which I don't have anymore. It disappeared. Yeah, yeah. We're <laughs> but that's another that. story. We get into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so I got back down to Skull, got my winter coat, and oh, I know, I went into town. I saw met a man I knew called Tom Brosnan. And he said, oh, they're recruiting. They're looking for workers down at the fish plant. Mm. Now, this might seem strange to some people that are a Fleet Street journalist working in the fish plant, but as a young boy growing up on markets, I worked on fish markets. Gotcha. So uh, I, and I'm quite happy with fish because the lovely thing about working with fish is, guess what? You can take your, what you're working with home and you can cook it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I finished up getting a job working at the fish plant in, in Skull doing it on the herring season, which now doesn't happen. And again, I got another poem from that. I won't bore you with all of them, which became Aaron's Herring. And it was the story about how the, you know, and I'll read a little bit of it. Will I read a little bit of it? Be my guest. You are the guest, so, of Hello? course. If I... All right, well, right, okay. You've, I thought you froze there for a moment. No, no, I'm good. I'll just read the top, the top end of it. It's called Herring's Herring. It says, in November of each year, herring shoals are plenty. Do flow up Erin's southwest rugged coast. With coats of silver blue and eyes of red, a cada milia and a cada milia of herring fished from sea and dumped down dead. Anyway, so that, so in other words, I was doing jobs. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, 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 I even cleaned toilets, you know, for, yeah. for money, cash. Um, they gave me a brush after uh, two or three weeks. <laughs> no, that's the wrong Monty. Sorry, that's the wrong Monty Python gag. So does that mean they? Oh no! Uh, so did they give you a wash or did they give you the physical brush? <laughs> yeah, no, it's Mr. Gumby from uh, from the Monty Python. Anyway. I know, I know. Um, <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so and then what happened then? Right, so I was working away there, and it was tough work. Um, and I remember a lady coming down or coming up to the fish plant and I was nominally the manager. I was not in charge of it totally, but I was made the manager. And so somebody said, oh, there's a lady out there. She said, want, wanted to know if there's any fish. And I so I went out and spoke to her and she wanted black sole. She, that, I remember specifically, she said, do you have a black sole, do you any black sole for me? And I remember saying to her, madam, lady, I don't. It's a nice piece of place but no black soul. I said, oh, I don't like place. That was my subsequent partner of 30 years, um, with mm -hmm. Catherine Julia Thomas. Yeah. That's how we met. Wow. Wow. Uh... So I was, in, I was in a house over the winter then, and then in the spring I needed to move out, and then um, Jules contacted me and said, oh, she had a house which was what they, she called a studio house, which was where she did a lot of her paintings. Which so is, in, which is in, the, in the documentaries. You can see the... Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So I there, and then she was previously married or had a partner and children. And 
um, I, I, apparently I came in quite useful because I was a bit tall, dark, tall and handsome and quite strong and could, could do gardening work. And eventually, you know, we became, um, you know, that, that, that thing that happens between men and women. God. <laughs> Birds and the bees. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, so there we are. And then for so I did various jobs over the years, and then I went back to full time journalism. And this is this will come back to your link. You can jump in on me after I finish this round. Uh, I did. I planted. I was worked for farmers. I was a spalpeen farmer, in, in effect. A, you know, a, sort of a journeyman labourer. I do different job building work and farming work. And then I went back to full time journalism in 1996, and was flying it, flying it when all of a sudden came the events of pre-Christmas 1996. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's a good segue because obviously with the, uh, with, the, with the first documentary that came out, which was the Netflix one, that's obviously where um, I suppose they kind of go into the fact that you had written a story. And obviously, as we mentioned, um, Sophie does go on the plenty eight, and, and I know you're going to be respectful here as well because we're talking about a woman that was murdered who you you know have continuously for 26 years protested your innocence on. Um, yeah, well, I mean, what what so what happened was so a murder occurred, it had nothing to do with me, whether you mm -hmm. want to believe that or not, it has nothing to do with me. I became the lead reporter on it for no other reason than one, I'm a very good reporter who just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And um, I started reporting on it. Yeah. Uh, the body was found on 3rd of December 1996. February was arrested for the first time and accused of the crime that I'd been reporting on. Okay. Which was obviously... Um, like and subsequently... Years unbeknown to me, while in custody, my partner, Jules Thomas, was also arrested for the first time. Okay. We're, one, I'm putting the emphasis on first time because we were both arrested on two occasions. I gotcha. accused of, of somehow being, you know, responsible for a crime without any evidence. Um, yeah. So I guess then, you know, as you, as you light a smoke as well, I can try and put a little bit of context as to what people probably do know or don't know. Um, obviously, the uh, the murder in West Cork, I believe, is the name of the the Netflix show, which probably most people were first familiar with. Um, yeah. No, I haven't that's the seen one, is that. It? Although I, that's I the haven't one. seen it. I'm, I'm just so you 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 know, and your listeners and watchers okay. know, I haven't seen that. Although I'm aware of it, and I'm aware of certain um, passages of the thing, which were uh, absolutely. Dirty Rotten Stinking Lies perpetuated. And I noticed there in one of the papers over the weekend, the, the there's an issue of to do with my long black coat coming up. But anyway, I'm digressing, was, sorry. No, no, I was I was going to get there because I, I'm, I'm kind of glad you mentioned that because it's obviously one of the, uh, it's kind of like the, the smoking gun thing that's used within this particular documentary. And also, yeah, they kind of uh, create the narrative as well that um, you had obviously written a piece on this murder and they were saying, well, how was he able to know before anybody else did? But you had obviously been... Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of how you were? No, no not particularly. I mean, I think I think the thing is this. I've got to be very careful at the moment because, of I course, know. as everybody everybody knows, yeah, that's Leonard Cohen's song, isn't it? Everybody knows mm -hmm. the table, the dice they are loaded. Everybody knows the game that is spent. Anyway, um, there's just been announced. Uh, I, I believe probably because I wrote to Ungarda Shirkana, the com new commissioner, to Harris in March of 2021, last year, yeah. and asked him um, to, to um, authorise a, a cold case review. Yeah. And last week, I heard, so it, they did what they call a scoping exercise. That took 15 months, apparently, mm -hmm. and many, many officers and a lot of resources. He, he announced last week that he will be, or has given the uh, go ahead for a cold case review 
Yeah, which is very interesting. I think they, they there's talk, obviously, about you. And I, I haven't DNA yet met them, well, but I've been contacted there? by them. Say that again. Oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to cut across you. Um, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, 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 no. Go on. I think um, there was talk about using um, some of the mo- kind of modern DNA evidence from the states and stuff like that to try and, you know. Uh, yeah, well, they, they should. I mean, they're, what they're, right. So, I mean, this, it, it's so complicated. We're talking about 25 years of, 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 of stuff. So, um, apparently, I only learned relatively recently as a result of a podcast by the two young people, uh, uh, Jennifer Ford and Sam Bungie, that um, there was. Uh, uh, alien DNA, i.e. not her blood DNA, found not on the body directly, but on her shoe. Sure. And now I know that, it, well, clearly it didn't match mine because they had mine and would have obviously, I assume, you know, uh, cross-referenced it. Yeah. From what I know, and I'm not a, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm qualified in, in the field of DNA and, and criminology and science, whatever. But it is possible from a very small sample now to tell not only uh, whether it's a male or a female's blood sample, but actually something of their ethnicity. Have I said that right? Ethnicity. Ethnicity, yeah. In other words, where, where they came from. Right. And, and that's a good segue, actually, because I was going to get into that documentary was followed then by um, the great Jim Sheridan. Um, no, the no, to get the chronology right. And I'm a bugger for getting things right. I think that was first, wasn't oh, it? But a lot of people yeah, saw it. Was. The, and they both yeah. came out in May last year. Yeah. And actually, what happened is, I mean, the, the Netflix uh, production or effort was and i said it beforehand i knew what it was going to be it was going to be a piece of self-serving demonizing propaganda and the reason i knew that was because there were shenanigans going on with the um the producer simon chin okay and also the french family were part of the production team yeah so how are you going to do an objective take you know and it wasn't objective it was and it contained deliberately deliberately uh, created um, scenes that were completely false okay relating to relating to a long black coat and that's that's kind of the coat and of course in this documentary we and we're, we're not going to mention names i know i know things are ongoing and stuff like that so we have to talk allegedly here but obviously no no we'll we'll, yeah. we'll keep it we'll, we'll, we'll keep it all coming We'll keep it all country by. We'll keep it absolutely country by. Um, but there obviously was a certain person that had said that they had seen you and then revoked that statement. Yeah, then- uh, yeah. There was a lady, and they persuaded her to say that she'd seen me um, maybe a few miles from the scene in the early hours of the morning on Monday, the twenty third. Uh, and they convinced her that I was the murderer and she was very susceptible and she gave a statement saying it was me. And then she subsequently, yeah, a few years later, um, in fact, 2003, I think, anyway, retracted all of the false statements. So there were a whole pile of them. And yeah. she, Of course. She, I with mean, that, there are many victims in this. And that's the thing. And with that, obviously, then people put two and two together and assume that Ian Bailey must be intimidating this lady and such and such. And that was you- the fault. That was the false allegation that was made. And it was actually used as the reason, the false allegation for my second arrest uh, mm. in, in, in uh, January, actually on my birthday, January the 27th of 1998. <sighs> yeah. And, and, anyway. and, and I understand, that, and I'm also very, you know, susceptible to know how this weighs on your shoulders too. So, you know, I, I, I do appreciate your time on this. Well, it's been, look, it's been a 25, it's, I mean, there are many victims in this, apart from Madame Sophie Toscan de Plantier and her family. Of course. There are myself, there is Jules, our families. There is Maria Farrell. Uh, sorry, uh, there are false witnesses who, who, you know, and and they were victims of this. What I would say was a conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. Of course, the, you know, the the powers that be will say, oh no, 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 but uh, that's that's what it was. Um, and then you've got the community, 
it split the community and still to some degree much much less now because i've got about 90 i reckon 95 percent support from people maybe 90 more than that there are a few fe- uh sorry i was going to say something rude then um you know naysayers will say naysayers out there uh who can't look me in the face <laughs> when i see them you know occasionally in the street um no there's many many victims and it's an it well i can't it's it it so i wrote to drew harris last year i do the serenity prayer a lot and i find it very very helpful i went into aa and um, i found that was a very sobering experience going into aa um they they use the serenity prayer which is very simple prayer and it says grant me the serenity to accept the things i cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And it was that first line that prompted me last year to write to Garda Commissioner Drew Harris, because I was thinking, what, 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 what can I do? Is there anything I can do? Sure. You know. and that, no, that makes a lot of sense. And, and to be fair, um, I followed up that documentary with the Jim Sheridan documentary, and I got a lot more context from that documentary, and I showed people. The, the yeah, well, point. the thing is, the Jim Doc was objective. Okay? Exactly. The, the, Netflix, the Netflix was a non-objective piece of demonizing propaganda. Exactly, but this, this this is where I was going with this because I knew, obviously, you know, the the the, the French side, the family are hurting. They want, you know, they just want it. You know, we got someone and that's it. Let's close this. Now, one thing that I found very, very strange and I suppose ironic that it was left out of the of the Netflix documentary was the blue, the blue French car with the with the French reg that was also seen on that night. Um, and that's that's something that's kind of, I suppose, irked me a little bit. I don't know, but I know that there were people around who were never accounted for. Yeah. And one yeah. of those people was about five foot eight, apparently, wearing a dark coat. Well, any dark coat's going to look like, you know, a dark coat. Yeah, of course. Um, who was seen in Skull by a certain person. Um, and there were other sightings when I got all the statements eventually through... Um, a long, long process. Um, there were not multiple, but yeah, there were multiple sightings of somebody who fitted the description generally in each each witness's statement that was never accounted for. Yeah, were they the killer? Also, there was a statement made by a, um, a man that on Monday, the twenty third of. De- December 1996, he was driving from West Cork, going in fact up to Cork, and he was driving towards a place called Doris to get on the N72 up to Cork, and he was overtaken on a blind bend at very high speed by a blue Ford Fiesta, and he was really pissed off, and when, and that was on the Monday morning, so on Tuesday the 24th, Christmas Eve, when the guards start doing their knock, knock on, you know, knock on the door, what were you doing yesterday? Do you have any information about that? And there was never an appeal. From the only, could there be a connection? And I think there was a connection between that speeding car and the the, the crime. Well, the fact that it, it had a red never, edge plate, which was which was a yeah, she was, he well. was very specific. Now. I actually saw one, one, one today. You don't see them anymore. They're agricultural plates, I think they called them. The farmers had the red plates. Mm-hmm. And it meant they got a lower rate of tax, road tax. Mm-hmm. So anyway, I mean, I only mentioned, just throw this in, and it's one of the things I'll be drawing to the attention of the, um, the cold case review team. Yeah. Um, for you, I suppose, obviously... <laughs> Again, there's been, uh, I need to bring this up as well. Obviously, there was the supposed confession of you and the car with the, with the young guy. No, they weren't actually. Uh, the best thing to do on that one is to look at the DPP's 2001 critique, which went through the entire case that the guards were trying to make against me. And I noticed a piece in the Sunday Independent East by Gene Kerrigan, which reminded me the fact the guards went around telling people 
oh, it was Ian Bailey, and not only was it Ian Bailey, he's going to kill again. Mm. Um, and the DPP went through all of the Garda evidence, and the, guard, the guards were constantly saying, give us permission to charge, or charge Bailey so we can, we can do him, and, you know, rid society of this, this, this menace, this English menace who's a threat to everybody in state security. Um, and he, the DPP's office completely rejected all of the, the nonsense the, the, that was put up to them by the guards. That's interesting, actually. Yeah. yeah because, and, and I, I wanted to bring it up to get your take on it, too, because, like I say, I want to put context on it as well for people that may be mm. listening to this for the first time or, you know, maybe aren't, aren't quite sure. Um, you obviously still get that question from randomers, I'd say, or when you're on these podcasts and, you, you know, did you do it? And of course, the, you've been protesting. You, are, you, are we talking? Are, are we are we talking about the question, which goes something like this: Did you murder Sophie Toscano Plantier? Are we talking yeah. about that question? That's that's the one you get, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I and I, I well, I I don't expect it from the you know respected members of the media uh, like yourself. You know, and I I've always said, and I you know, hand on heart. God above knows, no, I have nothing to do with this, this yeah. terrible crime. And this I have nothing on my conscience about it. Now, do you think as well, by the way, yep. here's a re I think it's called a re what they call a rhetorical question. Sure. Um, do you know what rhetoric is, by the way? I do, of course, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's fancy gobshite. Yeah. Tree is rhetoric. Anyway, um, do you think that a person who had done this would be in the position, well, you know, like me, 25 years on, I've always denied any involvement, which is correct. I fought and battled many different, you know, fora, forum, fora, um, and I'm still doing it. Do you think, realistically, if I had killed her, I'd be here talking to you like this, that I'd be able to sleep at night, be relatively, peaceful and content within myself well i'll tell no, you what I, I i'll answer not. that i'll answer that yeah um and it's a question that i have put to people when we've had debates and such i would think if you were that kind of cold type of killer that could just you know do what was done to, to that poor girl and um, that there would have been some sort of enjoyment or excitement of it and it would happen again and again and again, the same way serial killers. Because when you look at the cycle of yeah. serial yeah, killers, yeah. it's 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 a crime of it, it, there's usually sexual perversion involved. There's usually kind of an excitement involved. So I'll be honest with you, I I I, I yeah, I, I can't really say that. You know, I, I I think. I mean, it would be just lovely for me uh, at some. My big prayer has been for many many years, and for Jules as well. Bless her. I see her around and, you know, I mean, like she's suffered. We both were tortured individually and sure, collectively. Sure, and, yeah. and, and, and still are, you know, and I use the word torture. It is a form of torture. Yeah. Um, by this false allegation. Um, you know, um, what was I going to say? <sighs> Sorry, I'm, I'm getting tired now, but... That's okay. Um, yeah, fine. shoot another question at me, bye. Well, I suppose that would uh, this leads me into what I was gonna what, what I was gonna ask you next. It, it's for somebody. I want to. I want people to put themselves kind of in your shoes, which is almost impossible. In fact, it is impossible. I, 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 it is. Nobody impossible. would want to be. Nobody would want to be in my shoes, sandals, or Wellingtons. I can tell you by. Yeah. Well, not your hat anyway. I'll stick with mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah, that's that's next. I've got I've got the t-shirt out now. I don't know if you can see that. It's Fajal in. Um, nice. Nice. No, I've got a DVD. A John out. Wayne state of mind almost, eh? Well, <laughs> there we are. You see, that's a metaphor. John Wayne state of mind. I've see got that? a DV a DVD, book of poetry. It's a t shirt. <clears throat> and guess what's next? The American baseball cap. Well, there you go. Fajal in. If you, if you need a model, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> No, I suppose. Look, I know. I, I know. We've 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 had a nice conversation. I'm sorry, sorry for that. Uh, that that um, that that uh, advertising break there. Anyway, 
that's what it, listen it's, it's it's absolutely no problem um i suppose the, the next question and i suppose the final question where we can have a bit of a conversation about it is you've obviously you mentioned there that you were in an aa should i say um yeah. you yeah. know you've 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 kind of beaten that you know thankfully yeah i mean i still have a drink of wine with food um i take yeah. the occasional pint i'm very moderated i don't drink spirits i think spirits was the problem actually well it was it was Sure, yeah. sure. You were looking for comfort in the bottom of a bottom of a bottle, and, and he, understandably, I, I definitely, dope. definitely for the first ten years of the torture. Uh yes, very definitely. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I'm a great fan of Morrissey. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Mancunian lad, you know. So I actually met to John Cooper. Oh, I didn't meet him, but I was speaking to John Cooper Clark, who's one of my uh, poetic heroes. But Morrissey, you know, Morrissey, the from uh, I'm Smiths. a fan. I'm a fan. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's one line in the song. I was happy for a drunken hour, but God knows how miserable I am now. Yeah. And I recognised in that lyric, you know, I was using alcohol as a, like an escape mechanism. Oh, you know, that's that's going to end in disaster. And yeah, because that's that's. I'm, I'm glad you you said that because I can see you now, and you look you look healthy again. You know, you're. You, you kind of you look like a man that's ready to kind of try and get his life back. If uh, and if not, you're gonna you're gonna die. Well, um, that's that that that's because I'm in a John Wayne state of mind. I'm in a John Wayne state of mind. You know. Yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> I get it. And but look, this is what I want to say. Like, if anybody's able to, you know, put themselves in your shoes, this was what I was getting at. You know, you've dealt yeah. with this for 25 years and 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 counting to for someone like yourself and, and you mentioned your partner, your former partner. Um, it, it's, it is a horrible thing if, if you're an innocent man to have to go through where everything has just been taken away from you. You've had to fight and fight. Oh, it's, just... uh, no, it's, it's, it's been terrible. It's been terrible. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'm, 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 I'm very sympathetic. In that. I, what it's, what it has done is though, Interestingly enough, because one of my prayers was that I wouldn't be, I didn't want to become embittered. And I think for the first 10 years, I, I know what it was. For the first 10 years, I was feeling victimized. I re really felt persecuted and victimized. And then I realized that that was a very pathetic state to be in. And I sort of, you know, hit rock bottom, went into AA, went on the program, followed all the things and then i sort of my you know sort of came back up again you know you hit bottom, rock bottom and either you're going to stay there you're going to be dead gone whatever or you float back up to the surface unfortunately you know i came back i'm a great fan of leonard cohen by the way who i very often finish up quoting and there's a great quote from the album the future which came out i think in 1990 I don't know, and 1990s, the future. He says in one line, he says, I'm as stubborn as those garbage bags which time cannot decay. I may be fundamentally flawed, but I'm hanging on in my fundamental way. Something like that. Okay. I'm, as, I'm, I'm, I'm as stubborn as those garbage bags which time cannot decay. Well, that's, look, that's a great way of, um, you know, and, and look, <clears throat> like I say, it's it's it's, it, and I know your message has always been that you you've never come out and and kind of uh, spoken ill of of Sophie's family or anything like that. You've always said that you want no, and I've always justice. been very sympathetic to them. I mean, yeah. I know ah now just on that point, I know that on day one or day two after the murder, the man who was charged with the responsibility of acting as the liaison between the Irish and the French state. There was no direct contact with the family. It was done state to state. Mm -hmm. it was a man who subsequently, years later, became the commissioner of Angada Shirkana. His name was Callanan. He had to either resign or was sacked under a cloud to do with this case mm -hmm. and to do with secret recordings of um, journalists ringing Bandon Barrack, witnesses ringing Bandon Barrack. But, uh, but they were assured from day one, have no doubt, it's that bollocks Bailey. And, and these were the words that were being used in the community when the guards were going around. So they, they now, I'm human. 
we're all human. Well, some of us are more human than others, maybe. If I was told that, I tend to believe that. Mm -hmm. And the French family decided to believe the false narrative. And I, I, you know, what can I do about that? I'm sorry for them. Yeah, yeah. Is there any any kind of closing words that you want to close off the, the as we as well? Well, we're coming up. We've been we've been talking for about an hour, haven't we? Yeah. We, I'm looking at the clock there. Yeah. Um. Nothing that springs to mind immediately, apart from this. I know. Here we go. Apart from this, this isn't isn't one of my poems. This is the first real poem that I heard. My father read it to me. And it's by a man called Rudyard Kipling. I'm sure some of your listeners will have heard of it. And uh, he wrote a poem called If. I'll, I'll just read. But what, what this poem is, and it's very, very useful, and every, everybody should read it. Or, um, young, it's uh, the father talking to the son and advising him on advice for life. And he says... If you can keep your head when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, but make allowances for their doubting too. If you wait to not be tired, uh, or being lied about, don't deal in lying, and yet don't look too good. But it resonated with me particularly because of the, you know, the, the, the people telling lies about me. So um, yeah, and I'm, 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 I've got a lot of projects on the go at the moment. Um, you know what it's like when you try to get things going. It requires a great deal of effort, and maybe money, funding. I'm trying to make a podcast. I'm in the process, I'll put it, phrase it another way, I am in the process of um, making a podcast. I'd love to make my own documentary, of which I've got a very strong idea of what I want, and I've got quite a lot of the material um, for it, on like filmed. Uh, what else am I up to? Uh, yeah, I've got the t-shirt, you know, it's fatal in, it's fatal in, yeah. which I think is, is the most amazing political campaign slogan of all time i think it's just whoever thought of that fair play to them yeah, yeah. You know, yes we can yes we can what <laughs> yeah I mean anything and nothing uh, absolutely uh, anyway absolutely. so there we are um yeah and you know um, obviously we've been through covid you know will i give you will i end on this one Will I end on a, a short poem that I wrote on the 5th of September, 2020? Yeah. That's just, you remember we were in lockdown? Yeah. We went to lockdown on the 16th, 17th of March, uh, 2020. And the thing I missed the most was I couldn't go to church and sing. I couldn't go to matches. I couldn't go to uh, sessions. And I really, and I used to be part of a pop-up choir. We couldn't, the, all of that was verboten, became verboten. So I wrote one poem called Verboten just before. And then, so Declan McCarthy of Baltimore, who is a wonderful man and organizes the, the Skibbereen Arts Festival. Nobody knew, you know, we were in lockdown, then we came out of lockdown, was it, were things gonna happen? And you remember the, the government introduced the thing where you could have, oh, you could have music again, but you couldn't have more than 50 people. Yes. Totally. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. And whatever the gig was, it had to be over within one hour, 30 minutes, otherwise it was breaking the law. Yeah. So Declan very um, skillfully got um, uh, uh, Cooney, Steve, uh, is it Steve? Um, you, might, you might help me here. Cooney, the um, musician, traditional oh. musician. Steve Cooney. Okay. Yeah, and Declan Byrne on the box to do a gig in, 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 in Skibbering Town Hall. That's two. There were two sound engineers and two um, stewards that left 44 people tickets. And I was lucky enough to be there. And I went home that night and I realised I had a nice Chinese meal, a nice bottle of wine. 
And then at five minutes to midnight, the muse came on me and I was looking around, something to write on. Jesus Christ. And all I could find was an envelope. So I wrote this and this is it. I thought I had a handle on it. Yeah, I thought I'd seen it all. But you know, something very, very strange has happened and the handle's fallen from my door. I can't open or close it anymore. Yeah, I thought I had a handle on it. I thought I'd seen it all. I'd seen Moses on the mountain. I'd seen the Ten Commandments written there in stone. I'd seen the writing on the wall. I'd seen Mother Mary, Jesus Christ, Judas and St. Paul. I'd seen the crown of thorns, the clash of horns, crusades and endless wars. I'd seen Nagasaki and Hiroshima and the fall of the Berlin Wall. Yeah, something very, very strange has happened. The handle's fallen from my door. I just can't open or close it anymore. That's, uh, that's awesome. And that came out. That came out as a perfect yeah. muse poem. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's very apparent to uh, to a lot of people that you know suffered and went through lockdown as well, and and came out the other side. So it's, I uh, know. Yeah. I now there is a sunny, there's you know, like, you know, the sunny side of it, and one of the sunny sides of it is that I think people have started to appreciate now things they took for granted a lot, you know, which yep. isn't bad. Oh, I've got a gag. Well, I, I you know, because I do sit down humour, not stand up comedy, but sit down humour. Well, I, I couldn't, give... have, I, I wouldn't have, t- I wouldn't have been able to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. Well, right. So the good things that have come out of it are people now appreciate things more and little simple things they took for granted are they really appreciate. Outdoor dining here in West Cork, wonderful. The council, use, if you put a chair outside of a, a cafe before COVID, you'd get a notice from the council saying, we're good, unless you remove your chair and table from the street, from the pavement, we're going to fine you. That's true. Now they're encouraging, you know. Yeah. What a vault fuss. Um, and... Yeah, so anyway, oh yeah, here's the one, right, I'll leave you on this. This is based, I think, on a, a lady poetic poet who talks about buses. She talks about, and she equates buses to being men, and she says, like, fucking effing buses, just like men. You wait ages, you go ages and ages and ages without one, and then guess what? Two or three turn up exactly at the same time. So here's the thing, what do international crises buses and partners have in common hit me well you know you go ages and ages and ages without one and then all of a sudden two of them come along <laughs> covid <laughs> and fucking putin oh god somebody oh, should stick man. the boot into putin by the way so somebody should definitely do what they did to rasputin and stick the boot into putin i tell you <laughs> something like that <laughs> <laughs> so are we um how are we good we are absolutely good it's been a it's been a pleasure and it's been uh been a pleasure to talk to you um, we'll, and we'll and likewise touch. likewise um so yeah. what i should say to you before we go is and and